for six months I couldn't I couldn't drive or go on the water and and that just really changed my whole perception of who I was. That is Kristen Wilson, today's guest, describing some of the personal challenges she had to overcome after a life-changing medical emergency she experienced in the airport of all places. Kristen is a location-independent entrepreneur. She has lived and worked from more than 60 countries over the last 20 years. She is a wealth of information in this episode is packed with value, I promise you, including advice around how to find your travel rhythm, one that works for you, how to get unstuck and figuring out what to do next in business or deciding on a next life project. Is it helpful to identify as something, to label yourself in some way, whether it's calling yourself a, quote, digital nomad or a flex pat, which, by the way, is a term I just heard for the first time in this conversation, or perhaps labeling yourself something else? We answer that question. We also discuss the importance of programming, paying attention to that programming that was installed within you, perhaps by family, culture, society, why it can be crucial to let go of some of that programming and how some of that programming just seems to stick around no matter where you go, for better or worse. The programming from the U.S. nine to five rat race and workaholism is also so embedded in my culture as well, that I kind of carry that with me wherever I go. I've been to more than 63 countries, and it's still difficult for me to fully turn that off. Kristen shares her number one advice for earning on YouTube so you don't waste your time, how the Costa Rican concept of Pura Vida still impacts her life, lessons from her journey from expat to nomad, which is interesting because I did the reverse journey from nomad to expat. So I was really curious to talk to her about that. Her top five favorite cities and towns for dot, dot, dot. We're going to ask her some fun questions, including her number one pick for community, for adventure travel, and for quality of life, a place you're going to want to spend some solid time. And if that weren't enough, I know by the end of this chat, you're going to feel inspired and fired up like I was. So you're going to get a chance to harness that positive energy with a powerful call to action that's going to send you off today after this episode with a specific task you can easily do today to help you realize your next travel or life goal. All of that happening right now in this episode. It's a fun one. So buckle up, strap in. Thanks for being here. And welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. You're listening to the Zero to Travel podcast, where we explore exciting travel-based work, lifestyle, and business opportunities, helping you to achieve your wildest travel dreams. And now your host, world wanderer and travel junkie, Jason Moore. Hey, it's Jason here with ZeroToTravel.com. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for hanging out, letting me bring a little travel into your ears today. This is the show to help you travel the world on your terms to fill your life with as much travel as you desire, no matter what your situation or experience. I'm back, baby. I'm back from a bit of a hiatus. I was traveling in the USA for three weeks with my family. It was incredible. Had a wonderful summer. And that ties in a little bit with something I'm going to share with you on the back end of this conversation with Kristen Wilson, who I should mention her website because since we recorded this, she has actually done a bit of a rebranding. You're going to hear me use the term badass digital nomads. That is her former brand. She's now moved everything over to travelingwithkristen.com and we'll link up to all that in the show notes. And I mean, when I said she's a wealth of information at the top of the show, I'm not kidding. I mean, she's been traveling around the world for 20 plus years. She has also personally planned and managed the relocations of more than a thousand people to 37 different countries. So as a relocation expert, she's been able to do that. She's worked jobs in foreign countries. She's worked for herself. She's DJed around the world. She's been a professional surfer. She penned digital nomads for dummies. I mean, she has been around. She's done it for herself and she's helped others live an unconventional lifestyle built around travel. And today, you're going to hear some of her best advice. So I know you're going to love it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of this community. Don't forget over at zerototravel.com slash newsletter, you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. goes out once a week. I write it. You can find out everything going on off the podcast over there. Stick around on the back end. I also want to give a shout out to somebody in this community who 
is hitting the road. And we always like to share these wins. And it's a great reminder as we go into this conversation that this is a community-powered show. I make this show for you, of course. So you're not alone while you're listening. And if you ever want to get in touch, please reach out via email, leave me a voicemail. Just, you know where to find me. Okay, without further ado, here's my conversation with Kristen Wilson. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you on the other side, my friend. Cheers. Kristen Wilson, welcome, finally, to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. How you doing? Thank you, Jason. It's so surreal to be here. Get out of here. I've been listening to you for since way before I had a podcast. So <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're sweet. Well, I mean, I think you've had a podcast for over five years now. So that just makes me really old. <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> Whereabouts in the world are you? I am currently in Miami, Florida, which is what was my home base during the pandemic. And then a couple years ago, I left. I can't even believe that was so long ago now. But I went back to Europe where I was traveling before the pandemic. And that's kind of been my second home over the years. And I just came back for the holidays and then st- went to Mexico and then came back again because my sister just had a baby this week. So I'm going to visit her in Las Vegas in the next few days and just kind of staying within a within a 15 minute drive to the airport for direct flights to go visit her throughout summer. Nice. I mean, that is the life of a nomad, what you just described, right? You're like here, there, everywhere. It's pretty interesting because you, you went from expat life to nomad life. For me, it was the opposite. So it's going to be really interesting. By the way, we're doing what we call in the business a show swap. I'm using air quotes. Kristen can see it. And so I'm going to get the privilege of going on her show, Badass Digital Nomads. And um, it's interesting because we have like this mirror reflection of like nomad expat and then your expat nomad. So I'm going to hit you with a bunch of questions first. And yeah, it'll be fun to go back on your show and kind of have the tables turned. I wanted to hear about your life as an expat, your previous life before your digital nomad life, because it sounded like you were living in Costa Rica, if I did my research correctly. But I have no idea how you ended up in Costa Rica. I know you were surfing professionally at some point, which is super cool. I, I'm like, I'm dying to ask some questions about that. But yeah, how did you end up living in Costa Rica? How long were you there for? Just give us like the sort of the chronology of your life when it comes to that? Well, originally, I was always really interested in the idea of travel. I think some of my first travel memories were looking at my mom's photo albums of her travels with her parents who worked at Pan Am during the golden years of flying. So there was always a lot of travel paraphernalia around the house. My grandma kept everything down to the first class menus from old Pan Am flights and the socks and all of the little trinkets. So I was just always fascinated with that. I joke around that I was such a big nerd that I used to read encyclopedias about different places because for all the young youngins out there, you know, when we didn't have the internet, all we had was books. So it was National Geographic magazines, reading encyclopedias from the grocery store to learn about the world. And This curiosity went through my high school years when I was finally old enough to be able to travel on my own. Of course, we did family vacations and things like that. But through my surfing career, I was able to travel with my friends and go places like Puerto Rico, Mexico, Hawaii. And so the older I got, the more I just really wanted to travel. I spent all my money on travel, like everything I saved from my jobs, teaching surf lessons, lifeguarding, working at a surf shop, working at restaurants. It just all went into travel. And when I got to college, I found out about study abroad programs and I it was something I wanted to do. But one day my dad went to a rotary meeting with a friend. So he wasn't a part of the rotary club, but he was invited to a lunch. And on the day that he went to that lunch, they were announcing a new scholarship program, which is called the Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship Program. And the head of the club was actually my 
high school cheerleading doctor, like our physical trainer for the football team and the cheerleading squad. And he said, you know, Jim, Kristen would be a great fit for this program. So my dad took the information home. I was a freshman in college at UCF at the time. And yeah, the rest is history. I applied for that program. It took a year or so to get through the application process. I actually won the scholarship and I was assigned to go to Costa Rica. So I had requested to go to Italy, but life had other plans. And that's how I ended up in Costa Rica for the first time. My first time living abroad, I just fell in love with the whole idea of living in other countries. It was like my entire worldview was just blown open and I wanted to go back. As as soon as I finished studying abroad, I actually did another semester in Australia, went back and graduated did my one-year MBA and then immediately went back to Costa Rica when I was only 22 years old. Hmm. And how many years did you spend there living? About seven or eight. So I was down there working in real estate and then I moved to Nicaragua for a year when I was 24, 25. And then I went back to Costa Rica and was there until about 2013, which is when I went nomadic because at that point, the technology had caught up to where I was already working from home anyway. So I was working from home in the Central Valley of Costa Rica and my staff and my team were all in different parts of the country. And I thought, you know, I could actually do my job from anywhere. I love Costa Rica, but it kind of came to the point where I felt like I needed to decide. It was beyond that point, actually, of getting residency, buying a house, and making my permanent life there or seeing the rest of the world. And the wanderlust definitely won out. Okay, I see. So the famous Costa Rican philosophy is pura vida. And it's, you know, really direct translation, like pure life. And I'm just wondering for you as an expat living there for so many years, what what that means to you? And is that different from what it might mean to the local population? We can get into that. But what does it mean to you? Were you able to, yeah, what does it mean to you? Do you think you were able to like actually, did it actually change your attitude, like your way of being? I think so. I mean, the closest way that I can describe Pura Vida is like aloha in Hawaii. It can mean, you know, it directly translates to pure life, but it can be a salutation when you see somebody. It can mean hello. It can mean thank you. It can mean cool. Like it's kind of like a filler word actually. So you hear it everywhere and it just is, it's such a part of the culture that it's almost like a fish being in water. Like you don't even really notice it after a while because the whole population is just on board with Pura Vida the same way it's Aloha in Hawaii. So I definitely think that it, it wasn't something that I consciously thought about all of the time, but definitely the lifestyle when you're riding around on a four-wheeler to get to work and everyone says Pura Vida to you throughout the day at restaurants and wherever you go and you're watching the sunset every night with other people in the community, with other foreigners, with other locals. It, it definitely it's in the air. Let's put it that way. But but it is funny to see it on t-shirts and coffee mugs and in the airport and stuff like that. And it can it can seem cliche and touristy from the outsider perspective, but but it's actually like a very uh, it's not serious, but it's just a very pronounced part of the culture in a way that it's very natural, it's very organic, and it's just very integrated with the people there. And it's a beautiful thing. Because it's so embedded in the culture, as you mentioned, you know, outside of the, like what you just described, yeah, like you say, you see it on t-shirts, it might seem cliche from the outside, but did that sort of cultural concept change your everyday life in any way? And you kind of came from a you know, the surfing, it's a bit like surf culture, right? This is kind of like laid back, I feel, is a, p- a part of it. Um, but, I mean, you you tell me, because you spent so many years in Costa Rica, do you think that it actually changed the way you live your everyday life and something you still carry with you today? Or was it just sort of a part of your daily life there now? Or there when you were there, I should say. 
Definitely. I think it, it, it definitely changed the trajectory of my life. Although the programming from the U S nine to five rat race and workaholism is also so embedded in my culture as well, that I kind of carry that with me wherever I go. I've been to more than 63 countries and it's still difficult for me to fully turn that off. I don't know if that has happened with you being in Norway, which is also a really laid back country in many ways. But the another reason why I went to Costa Rica after grad school and I took my first job there versus going to one of the big consulting companies in the US or taking a traditional job in a in an office park or a cubicle in Orlando where I was living at the time is because I burnt out in grad school. So I was doing a full-time MBA. I was working as a grad assistant. I was doing an unpaid internship. I had this full course load. I was doing community service and other kinds of projects. I was working part-time and I just totally burnt out. I actually basically passed out in an airport, in an Atlanta airport on my way to... Yeah. On my way to Costa Rica during midterms of my first semester of business school, I had a grand mal seizure in the Atlanta airport. Oh my gosh. I know. From stress, you think? From all of the just the stuff you had going on or was it? Yeah, I think it was a combination of stress from my first semester in school, trying to juggle all of these different responsibilities. And I also didn't know the effects of caffeine on my body yet. So I was drinking a lot of coffee because that's what everybody does. And I I was also drinking Red Bull and sugar-free energy drinks because I thought it was okay to just you know, drink espresso and coffee in the morning and then at night to study, drink more energy drinks. And so I think it just really impacted my sleep and I was on a lack of sleep and I, I just burnt out. So it's actually crazy how I even found out what happened because all I remember is getting off of the airport train and going up the escalator and then waking up on the floor. And there were all these people around me and I was so confused, like what is going on? And and then they put me in a wheelchair and put me on the plane and I, I went to Costa Rica. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> and, oh my gosh, I know. really? I, I couldn't believe it in hindsight. I'm like, why? Like, They're why just like, come they... on, get up, Kristen. You got this. You got this. Take that trip to Costa Rica. It's yeah. Like, oh my gosh, wow. It, it was so surreal. And, and this was before we had iPhones. So my phone didn't even really work. This was in 2004. So I get to Costa Rica, my head is hurting, my jaw is sore. I didn't know what happened. I just thought I passed out. And then I get back to the airport on on the way back to Orlando and I turn on, you know, when you get you get out of the plane, you turn on your phone or now you turn it on when you're on the plane. But I turn it on and I, I called my brother because my parents knew what happened. I called them before I got on the plane, but I hadn't talked to them since since I was in Costa Rica. So when I got back a few days later, I turned on my phone to call my brother and tell him what happened. He's like, yeah, are you okay? I'm like, I think so. And this guy taps me on the shoulder and I'm like, oh, hold on, Jimmy. And he just comes up and he's like, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? And I was like, "Uh, yes, who are you? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm a dentist. My friend is a doctor. We were on our way to this conference and we caught you like you fell and we caught you mid fall and prevented you from hitting your head. He said, do you have epilepsy? And I was like, no. And he said, you should probably get that checked out because you had a a two or three minute grand mal seizure. And so if this guy hadn't have recognized me in the Atlanta airport and he was with his wife going on vacation, he just happened to be there both times. I mean, it was just the craziest coincidence. And so that's how I know that I had a seizure because this doctor or dentist told me, and then I went and got medical checkups and yada, yada, yada. So that, I mean, it changed everything about my life. I had my driver's license taken away. I couldn't surf anymore. It was like everything that, really? yeah, because they, they don't know how, if you'll have another one. So they don't want you to wreck the car or drown. Um, so yeah, for six months I couldn't I couldn't drive or go on the water. 
and and that just really changed my whole perception of who I was. And and that's why I ended up going back to Costa Rica because nothing ever happened again. I never had another seizure that I'm aware of for the rest of my life, but I thought, okay, if I'm going to go straight from burnout at 21 at that point, what's going to happen when I'm working in corporate America at 40 or 45 and I'm having my midlife crisis and I'm burnt out again. So I decided not to take any jobs in the US and and take the job in Costa Rica because I thought I needed like a gap year, which then turned into my real life for the rest of my life. Right. Wow. You know what you just mentioned too, the idea of like the gap year turning into the rest of your life for up to now. That's one of those sort of practical takeaways too, like for anybody listening. It seems like that's a trend here on the show. I'm sure on your show too. It's like somebody starts with like a summer off or a gap year or something like that. And then it just snowballs into something else. And I do think that's not that, you know, you intentionally kickstart a nomadic life or a life as an expat or whatever that way. But if you're trying to look at like a complete lifestyle change, sometimes it's easier just to take a small bite and kind of see where it leads because usually it leads to something else instead. It's just more managed, kind of more manageable to get your head around. Like it's almost too much. I feel like, you know, for becoming a nomad, it might psych somebody out if it's like, Oh, I'm going to be nomadic. And like, who knows I'm going to travel indefinitely like that works for some people. Other people might be a bit too overwhelming and they just end up like not doing it at all. Whereas if they took a gap year or a, a six months or whatever, it might be a little more, you can get your head around it, I guess. I mean, it's one thing to change your life. Like you don't like what you're doing and then you kind of work through a process where you're and that's different for everybody, this sort of transitional phase where you're kind of trying to get to the next thing. But then there's these sudden things like this, where like all of a sudden and you can't surf, you can't, you know, drive, you can't like sort of do things that you normally could do. And of course that's, I mean, how was that for you? Kind of like you mentioned it, not questioning your identity, but it kind of like, you know, taking away the things that you are part of who you thought you were and having to kind of move through to a new sort of phase. What, what did you learn from that? Yes. I I think that it made me open to change for the rest of my life because up until that point, I hadn't had anything very traumatic happen to me like that, like a health crisis. And it just put everything into perspective. And it made me so much more open-minded when I did go back to Costa Rica. And for many years after that, that I thought, you know, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know everything. I don't even know myself. You know, maybe there's other layers to me to me and my personality that I hadn't uncovered yet. And so I was able to just explore more in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a really special place because people from so many countries move there because of the the natural beauty, the beaches, the ecotourism. So in the the tiny town where I was living, which is called Nosara, it was so cut off from civilization. I think even to this day, there's still dirt roads there, but it was probably five hours, six hours drive from San Jose. And you'd have people living there from Switzerland, Germany, Italy, all throughout Latin America, like Venezuela, Mexico. I mean, the the town had just a couple thousand people in it, but locals and then the foreigners that were there were from every country you can think of. So it was a real life education and I was never the same after after I left there. Just the I was so grateful to be able to get back into the water and surf and to be able to drive around and be self-sufficient that it was like nothing could bother me. And and then I started traveling from there and going to Panama, Nicaragua, Honduras, uh, taking little mini sabbaticals and traveling to Europe with my mom and and just really easing into this international lifestyle. And now I don't even really surf anymore. I, I feel like that was a phase that of my younger life. And I still think about, you know, maybe going on a surf trip or something sometimes, but I've I've developed so many different interests through traveling and living abroad that it's just, you know, one chapter of my story. What you mentioned there of kind of like 
yeah, taking that opportunity to be open to exploring, I think that's a really healthy way to kind of look at some of these big sudden changes like you experience, right? Like you could be like kind of focused on what it took away or you can be like, okay, this is, I'm open to sort of exploring these next things. This is resonating with me because I'm kind of like in one of these phases now, not in the same way because I didn't have anything like that happen, but just kind of that idea of, yeah, getting excited about the exploration of the new things, even when you're you're not sure what they are, <laughs> which can be tricky. Whenever I was exposed to what my friends were doing in the US, like if I looked on Facebook and saw their posts going to corporate events and conferences and business trips, or if I was passing through the US at an airport and going in the Sky Club and seeing a lot of important people on phone calls and things, sometimes I would kind of feel self-conscious about my decision because I went to work in flip-flops on a four-wheeler wearing a, a mask to keep dust out of my face. You know, like my lifestyle in Costa Rica was really laid back and I needed that and I embraced it and I loved it. But still, you know, we're wired to be accepted as part of a community. And when I would go back to the U.S. once a year to visit, sometimes I would feel like maybe I should be doing something more traditional because everybody else, you know, had these big job titles and things. And I was just like, yeah, I'm living in Costa Rica. You know, I kind of work for myself and help people with moving there and sell real estate. So that programming was still really, really strong. I mean, of course I've gotten over it now. I've never actually had a, a corporate job or anything like that. So I can't really relate, but you know, from the outside, I would come back through and, and see people really busy and rushing around and on business trips and things like that. And I would think like, wow, my life really went in a different direction. And I'm kind of the black sheep of of my community when I go back to the US, but when I was in Costa Rica and when I was traveling through these countries and meeting other travelers, I really felt accepted and I really felt at home. And I felt like other people understood what I was doing because they were doing their own version of the same thing. Like everyone has a different life when you're out there traveling or when you're living in other countries and you don't get that societal pressure from the country that you're in because you're not technically part of their community. Uh, even if you become a citizen and even if you learn the language, you're always like slightly a little bit on the outside. But I think that's why other travelers are like um, birds of a feather in that way. Mm -hmm. I had flashes of the same thing. I think this is like a fair warning to anybody listening who's on an unconventional path or choosing an unconventional path. And maybe like some of those unconventional paths are more conventional now, or they seem more conventional because of the internet bubbles we're in. It's like, oh, it's totally normal to be a nomad, but still most people aren't nomadic in life, right? But you're right. Like, yeah, there were times when certainly, you know, if you're on a certain path that is different than what a lot, like what the path looks for your, the society you come from, like uh, the, the nine to five and that sort of thing. Yeah, you get to these points where you're like, let's say you're in your early 30s and you're like, oh, my friends are getting married. Like, look at they've like gone up the corporate ladder and they're making really good living. Like, I'm getting left behind. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like like you said, you're kind of wired. You grew up with that or at least, you know, we're on the same page we did. You know, somebody listening might have their own version of that. It's important to to acknowledge, I think, because, you know, you have to be kind of strong and and stay stay the course even if you don't know where it is and and not succumb to the to the pressure of a lifestyle that you don't you don't really want just because everybody else is doing it. Yeah, and when I came back during the pandemic, that was the first time that I lived in the US again since I was in college. So I I graduated from grad school in 2005. I grew up in Florida, so native Floridian, lived in so many different places around Florida, but yeah, that was really, I guess I had came back once in 2016. I was living in St. Pete Beach where my grandparents lived and I was I was helping them with some stuff. But then I left again in 2017 and was fully nomadic from then until the pandemic. I got back to Florida just two weeks before the lockdown started and I was just coming to Miami for Miami Music Week. I, I wasn't planning on staying 
but then I, <laughs> then I stayed and, and I did really love that, that time off from traveling to reflect. And I, you know, I know lots of crazy stuff was happening in the world, but I think I was personally back at a, a stage of burnout, but from travel, travel and working. And then as a content creator, a new content creator, I had just started my podcast in 2019 and I, I had started filming my travels in 2018. So that la- adds another layer of complexity to travel because you're not just doing it for yourself or for fun anymore, but you're also doing it to share in some logical and creative and engaging way with other people what you're doing so that they can do it too. And so I was a couple of years into doing that. And so that was a much needed break. But that the whole point of that story was just that once I had that normal lifestyle, although it wasn't really normal during the pandemic, but as we all came out of the lockdowns and everything, it, it kind of became normal. And I just started to feel that internal urge to move again. Like I loved my apartment. I had a great lifestyle, but I just felt like I was on autopilot and maybe my normal is be, you know, experiencing change and different environments. And so after about two years living the the kind of normal lifestyle in Miami, I decided to go back to Europe in, in 2022. So, and I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever stop traveling, but it it's, I don't know what the end game is. Maybe, you know, for us nomads, because you, I think you eventually settle somewhere. You've settled in Norway. A lot of other people that have been in this lifestyle for 10 or 15 or 20 years, they start to slow down and settle down. And some people go back to their home countries or some people go to other places. You know, I think for me, it might be a combination of a couple of different home bases because I've really want to spend time with my family in the US, but I don't want to live here full time. I want to be abroad. So yeah, to be to be confirmed, we'll have to circle back in a few years and see what's going on. Yeah. Well, you mentioned travel burnouts. I was just wondering what your advice is for dealing with that. Well, it depends on what phase you're in. So for anyone listening, there's going to be a range of people. There will be people who haven't yet started their travel lifestyles or journeys yet. There'll be people who are just a few months or a year in. There'll be some veterans out there. And I think it's it's kind of okay to burn yourself out with traveling at the beginning because that's how you learn. And, you know, we've both done like the backpacking thing and we've traveled without working, we've traveled with working. And so I think everyone just finds the rhythm that that works for them. And if you're 21 or 25, or or even if you're 65 and you've just retired and you just want to see the world as fast as possible, and you've got a lot of places on your bucket list, like just go for it. And and your inner self is going to tell you when it's time to slow down. That might come three months into your trip. That might come seven years into your experience. You know, it's different for every person. And I still see nomads that I've known for seven or eight years, and they're still traveling at a pace that I definitely couldn't sustain, like a different place every week or a different place every month. And I'm kind of edging more to the place of six months. Like last year, I spent six months in the UK in Manchester. This summer, I'm going to spend five months in Miami, and then I'll probably go to Europe for the winter season and go snowboarding or something and stay in one place for another four or five months. Like that, that for me really, really works in a way that I can feel like I have a normal work life balance and still get to get out and sightsee and do different things and go on side trips. So you're a slow mad. I'm a slow mad. I love how they come up with these terms. (laughs) It's just like you think every term was invented and then they come up with a new one. Slow mad. <laughs> yeah. I heard a new one called Flex Pat. Flex Pat. And I was okay. like, oh, oh that's also me. <laughs> a, a part-time ex I just call it a part-time expat, but now there's a term for that too. Yeah. So are terms like that, is it semantics or are they helpful? You know what I mean? Like, is it helpful to 
think about your travel through the lens of like identifying as a slow mad or is it just like, well, whatever you want to call it, this is just what I do and it feels good. It is helpful. You know, it's ironic because a lot of us want to travel to eschew labels, but having traveled without these labels, that was a lot more confusing. And I remember when somebody told me what a digital nomad was, it was actually in a, a client call. So I'm on the phone and I was explaining where I was. And he said, you're like one of those digital nomads. And I was like, a what? And I I I Googled it. (laughs) I was on a Skype call and I Googled it while I was on the call. And I thought, oh my God, these are my people. (laughs) And and so you do feel like a part of a community. You know, the closest I got to that before was reading Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week. And I told my mom, I was like, I met my future husband in this book <laughs> because he was the only person I had met that that was doing something similar. And that was in 2007. And I happened to be visiting my sister back at UCF and I was in the Barnes and Noble on her campus bookstore. And that's where I saw his book. And then, you know, it, the rest is history. That became a cult classic. But it, it's weird to think that I, I mean, I had no idea who, like what I was as far as a category of traveler or person. And then when you see someone else and that reflects like a mirror, what your life is like, and you see those similarities, it just gives you a sense of comfort in a way. And so now I'm, I'm really happy that people understand. But I am also grateful for those experiences, as you mentioned, going from being an expat to a nomad, you know, being a digital nomad has been technically possible since the the internet in the nineties. And I'm sure there are people who have been doing it that are just under the radar. Like I met some guy in the, in the gambling industry in Costa Rica who had lived on an Island in the South Pacific. And he set up gaming websites from these obscure islands and they had satellite internet out there and he was one of the first digital nomads, but neither of us knew what that was at that point. So I'm sure there's a lot of people who've been doing it for for way longer, but going from that traditional expat lifestyle, because that was the only option that I knew about. It was like backpacking or being like a real nomad where you're just a traveler and then living abroad part-time or you know, for a year or a few years. I always thought I would eventually just go back to the U.S., but then technology gave us the opportunity to be digital nomads and really design life the way that we want. And now there's this plethora of really funny (laughs) names and labels, but it it can be helpful for people to identify with. And and for many people, it's going to change. So for you as well, like some form, some phases of your life, you are a digital nomad. Sometimes you're on sabbatical and you're traveling and sometimes you're an expat and then you settle down and get residency or citizenship. So it can help to define the phase of life that you're in. Do you agree? Yeah, I hadn't thought it out too much, but hearing you describe it, it's definitely, I can see, like you said, you can, it can help you sort of track down community around that terminology, right? If you identify with that term and you're like, oh, that's me. And then like you immediately find other people doing it. And like you said, these are my people. Then that can certainly be helpful in terms of adding to your lifestyle by like finding that community. And then, yeah, I guess you could also say it's validating in a way, right? Like if you just think you're this weirdo living this kind of crazy lifestyle and then you meet other people doing it and then you're just like, oh, cool. Like we were living in a way that we're like, we don't need validation for our lifestyles, but at the same time, we want to be validated and not be alone, <laughs> <We do>. you know? <laughs> We're so, still humans. We're yeah. still, you know, yeah. I found out what a digital nomad was in 2012 or 2013. I think it might've been 2013 because that's when I was on my solo around the world trip. I didn't meet another digital nomad in the wild until I went on nomad cruise in 2018. So there's five years where I knew what a digital nomad was and I hadn't organically met another digital nomad. So I still felt like a weirdo. (laughs) Although my my best friend- Think about how much it's changed now, how many people. So you've run into them everywhere now. And if you go to the hotspots, you know. 
everywhere. Now there's like, people are like, it's too, you know, it's overcrowded or nomads are ruining the planet, um, which I think is a little blown out of proportion. But yeah, the only person I knew was my friend MJ, who we were roommates in Costa Rica. And she's still a nomad today. She mostly lives between Bali and Portugal and also has houses in Costa Rica. But yeah, other than her, which who I met in Costa Rica before I became nomadic, it, I didn't meet anybody out in the wild, so to speak. I met a lot of travelers. I met a lot of expats. I met a lot of uh, transplants and cool people. But yeah, no nomads. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the label thing, like you could also say, like you said, you know, be willing to change it. And, you know, you could, if you're listening and you find it helpful to identify with a label, you know, see which ones are out there and be like, I'm a slow mad, you know, maybe that's better than being a nomad. Maybe that feels better, whatever. But then you can adopt that, but maybe don't hold on to it so tightly, you know? Yeah. Which is not an easy thing to do with identity, you know? Yeah. I've been struggling with that with my, with my podcast because it's called, badass digital nomads because the idea was to interview digital nomads about how they did it, how they became nomads. But I'm not even a a nomad all the time. It's just like, I don't know. It's like you, you, you know, the labels, but then you can take it or leave it kind of. And, and a lot of the people that listen to my show, they're, they're not nomads, they're slow mads or they're expats or they're roving retirees or there's, you know, all these labels now. So I think, in my mind, collectively, it, being a digital nomad is more of a a mindset of freedom, not necessarily a paper definition. Yeah, you mentioned the name of your podcast, but like it's like kind of the spirit behind it, right? That's really what you're you're looking at, or you're trying to feel out in a way, right? Like there's no technical definition. I suppose there could be. I mean, and you're interesting to uh, to talk about in terms of the digital nomad movement because you've been writing about it so much. I mean, I know you wrote the Digital Nomad for Dummies book and, you know, to write a book like that, you need to, yeah, you need to think a lot about what you believe, what you kind of, yeah, you you need to, to write a book, you need to be able to like sort of clarify your thoughts and then get them down in writing. And I'm just wondering on that topic, and we're going to get some destination stuff because I know you have a, a video that did pretty well that like, lists out your favorite countries for certain things like community and adventure and things like that. So I wanted to get some of those from you having been to 63 countries now, just on the digital nomad topic, you know, if somebody is wanting to get into that lifestyle, but they don't have any experience, what's your best advice for them? It's really to just start where you are. As we were talking about a little bit earlier in the podcast, you don't have to have it all figured out. Like you don't have to have your 10 year plan. You can set goals for yourself, but until you get out there, you won't know if you like it or where you want to go or how long you want to stay places or who you're going to meet and all the different things that can happen when you're in this lifestyle. But chances are, something more will happen than if you stayed home. So you're going to have all these other external factors and people that you haven't met yet and things that are outside of your control. So keep it flexible. But I think it is really important to know why you want to do this. You know, hopefully more than just like, oh, I would just want to travel. Like try to go really deep into why and I have a, an exercise that I, I share. I think it's, yeah, I shared in my book, I shared it with, with some of my relocation clients where you ask yourself why you want to do something. So why do you want to be a digital nomad or why do you want to move to Portugal or why do you want to retire in Thailand? Like whatever the thing is for you that you want to do, it's valid, but like try to get to the root of that. And you ask yourself why you want to do something, you answer it, and then you repeat that five, six, seven times. And when you keep answering your question over and over again, you you come up with different answers every time. And it's like the last answer you get to, whether it's your third answer, your fifth answer, your 10th answer, that's going to be what's really driving that and motivating this life change. And so that can be really helpful when, yeah, when you find yourself one day 
hiking up a mountain in Bulgaria by yourself and you're like, why am I here? <laughs> what am I doing here? And yeah, so that that's really helped guide me and we all have all our different personal reasons for that. So you want to narrow that down first and then that can speak to, okay, where are you going to go? Because people get so confused with where to go because if you look online, there's a trillion different recommendations for places to live and the digital nomad hotspots and all that stuff. But I like to start with, you know, what people want. So some people will be called to go to Uganda and some people want to go to New Zealand or some people will want to go to Bali. So it's like, why do you want to do what you want to do? Where do you want to go because of that? Like, what are you seeking there? What is the experience that you want to have? And also, you don't want to forget about how you're funding the lifestyle. So if you are a digital nomad, that means that you're working in some way. You have some form of income. If if you're just traveling on your savings, it's you know a bit different. So you're going to want to approach it a different way. But as a nomad, you want to definitely consider your work hours, your schedule, who you're reporting to, which time zone you want to be working in, where you're going to work. Are you going to work at home, co-working spaces? All of that can kind of fill in the gaps, but it starts with why you want to do what you want to do and where you want to go to start out. What's your why right now for you personally? My why right now is all family related. So it's also a little bit about slowing down, but when I found out my sister was pregnant, I knew I wanted to be close. So I have one niece who's nine, and this is my first nephew. And before I found out about that, I had planned to be in Europe this summer, but I didn't want to be on the other side of the ocean when my little sister had her first baby. So it's it's all about just being near family, supporting them. And, and my personal why right now is is just to be in one place so that I can have my routine. We talked a little bit about this off, off the record, but, um, I have, you know, my work with helping people relocate around the world. I have my YouTube channel traveling with Kristen, where I publish a weekly video. I also have a weekly podcast, badass digital nomads. And then in my free time, my hobby is DJing and music production So it was really important for me to be in one place and set up my music studio and be able to, you know, record podcasts and, and make videos and do my music and just be in one place for a while without switching locations. So I'm really happy here. And and this whole situation kind of fell in my lap where a friend of mine was going up north to Cape Cod for the summer and she needed someone to sublet her apartment on this beautiful island in the middle of the bay in the, I'm in the middle of Biscayne Bay, just looking at the water in Miami. And she's like, do you want to rent here for five months? And I said, yes. (laughs) And it's just idyllic. I feel like I'm living in a resort. Yeah. That sounds epic. I'm going to ask you about music, but uh, one more quick business related question. We all know as listening to the show, it's not just business because it's lifestyle too, but what do you do when, you're feeling stuck. Like how do you get unstuck when you're deciding what to do next business wise? Let's say you're like, I need to add another stream of income to my business, or I want to like, want to try to grow my business, or I want to maybe do something different. And I want to stop this project and do the next one. And, and you're feeling stuck, which I'm sure like we all get stuck at some points. How do you get unstuck? How do you decide what to do? Is it a sort of like methodical kind of like market research type thing or is it intuitive? How do you, how do you manage that? I've noticed that when it's time to make a change, it's usually something that, that starts as like a seed, like a little tiny passing thought that you almost ignore it. And then if it's something real for you to follow, it starts to grow and grow over, over time. And I've noticed in my career that I've pivoted about once every seven years. And like I went from real estate in Costa Rica to relocation full time and helping people move around the world. I did that from 2011 until now, but around 2018 is when I started with content creation. And for me, that was a, a way, it was a creative outlet 
Like I felt like I was working all of the time, but I didn't create anything. I didn't see myself as an artist. Like I didn't understand my creativity. So starting a YouTube channel, writing on Medium, like I wanted to write books. I wanted to have a podcast. I wanted to just express myself in in different ways. And so that's why I started all of those other projects that then turned into businesses. And now I feel like there's so much information out there on the internet that it's really just important to listen to yourself. And so just like how I gave the example of how I choose a travel destination when I really think deeply about why, like why do I want to go to this place? It's not just have 50 places on a bucket list and want to check them all off, but like what is the reason I'm going to travel to one country or another Well, sometimes you might not have a big reason. You just want to go. That's fine too. But it's kind of like that with me with um, with my career. So I don't really like feel like I get lots of everyone has challenges, like strategic challenges and problems like that in business. But right now I don't I don't really feel stuck because I feel like I have almost too many things going on. It's more about keeping everything going and having really good processes in place so that I can continue doing the things that I love and also, you know, growing them, growing my income, growing my business and, you know, still having time to have fun. So when I, when I get stuck on things, I I journal a lot. I'm a big fan of morning pages. If anyone has read The Artist's Way. I actually found out about that from Tim Ferriss. He did a community post on YouTube about morning pages. And I thought, what is that? And then I ended up reading The Artist's Way like five times in seven years or something. Um, So that really helps like journaling. I'm in a lot of masterminds for different topics, for YouTube, for podcasting, for just general business. I have coaches. So it's really as you mentioned earlier, it's about having a community and not just sitting with your problems and ruminating about them, but asking other people for their professional opinions and their perspectives. Uh, I, I luckily have met so many people now through this lifestyle and um, you know, everyone's just a, a Facebook message or a WhatsApp message away. So I, I reach to people that have a lot of business, a, a lot of experience in my industries or even in an adjacent industry like the tech industry that have started companies and sold them and exited. So, you know, things that I haven't done before. So it's really a combination of self-reflection and and research over time before making a decision and then also reaching out to other people that can help with that. And I feel like that's been working pretty well for me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm in the uh, in a phase right now where I'm doing a lot of talking with other people and trying to feel it out. But I mean, I like what you said, you know, the specific example of content creation and, you know, the, the thing you said wasn't like, well, I think, you know, YouTube's a big um, opportunity or it's still early in podcasts and I'm going to get in. The thing you said was you had a desire to express yourself. And at the heart of it, that's the thing that will carry you, right? Like, okay, so now you can figure out what that means in terms of practicality. You know, is it what what type of content am I going to make? How am I going to present it? How can I earn an income from this and all that? But at the heart of it, it's, and I'm just using that as an example. I, I, I think that desire to express yourself, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's helpful to hear and to kind of, yeah, maybe for somebody listening that helps them lock in on, on something a little bit deeper going back to that exercise you mentioned earlier. Like I think that was a good example of your why and kind of like the root of it, you know, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, that, that is, that was the why. I mean, I had in my Apple notes app, just hundreds of ideas for blog articles. And I had all these book manuscripts that I hadn't finished from when I was younger. Like I had a book called The Surfer Girl Diet that I was writing during college. And I actually found it recently, my manuscript, and it was a cookbook with with recipes that were inspired by all the places I traveled. So it was always something that I wanted to do. I just thought I have to be a business person first and then do that later when I have time, quote unquote. 
But then it got to the point where I just wasn't feeling happy or fulfilled in my lifestyle, which which was like crazy <laughs> because I had my own business. I wasn't working that much. Like I was working maybe 30 hours a week, like 20 or 30 hours a week. I was traveling the world full time. I was having so much fun on the outside, but I mean, I was having fun, like for sure. I mean, I would be, you know, drinking wine with my friends in Italy and meeting up with my friends on their business trips to the Philippines or whatever. Like I was jet setting around the world. I was having a blast. I was making good money, but I felt like I was ignoring myself. Like I was ignoring the call to create content or I don't want to even say like, oh, create content. Like I was ignoring the call to create. I was ignoring the call to put myself out there and make myself vulnerable by putting my opinions on paper or on the screen and speaking out on on topics. And so it just came to the point where like I'm still doing the same thing for work. It wasn't about what I was doing for work. I, I've been helping people relocate to other countries since 2011 and I still do that and I love it. It was just I was missing this other piece. And once I added that, it was like, wow, I'm off to the races now because I gave myself permission to be an artist, to be a podcaster, to be a videographer, to be a musician, like all of these different things that for a long time I didn't think I was good at because my art teacher told me I was bad at drawing and painting in third grade. You know, <laughs> I'm sure other people have uh, situations like that. So damn you, third grade art teacher. Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> as it echoes yeah. off the canyons. Um, I, yeah, no. <laughs> so we, we live in this time where you can be whatever you want. Like when I was researching for digital nomads for dummies, I found the most obscure jobs that people were doing. I mean, um, people who were designers for like video game avatars. And like, I mean, now like you can make a full time income on on Instagram and having brand deals and selling products and your photos and videos. Like it's really, there's so many things you can do. Like it doesn't have to even exist. You can just invent your own job and, and d declare to people that that's what you do. Or you might not even have a job description. You might just have seven different revenue streams that come from random things that add up to a livable income that lets you do you and travel around. So it, it's really it's a cool time, you know, it's a cool time to be alive. And especially as a female, like it's weird to think how the world was a hundred years from now and how much, how much more freedom we have, but it's not just women. I mean, it's men and women from, from a lot of different countries. And I hope that will just continue uh, to expand. Let's get your favorite country for dot, dot, dot. I'm just going to ask you for five of these. And if you want the other five, look at what I'm doing here, Kristen, giving people an excuse to go to your YouTube channel. And we can link up to that video. I'm sure you know these offhand. And maybe if not, you can pull it up. But do you mind if we just do your top five favorite countries for dot, 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 and I'll give you the category and you can just tell me what it is? Sure. Okay. But disclaimer, it might have changed. That's since okay. I made Good. That video. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I, I, we welcome change here. Kristen. Okay. Favorite country for community? The first thing that pops to mind, it's not even a country, it's a town, is Bansko, Bulgaria. Because it's so small that, you know, you can't walk down the street without seeing 33 different digital nomads walking around. <laughs> I know. It's their last year. Yeah. It was a. Uh... It's, there's a Were scene you there for, for sure. Nomad Fest? No, I was there just for a ski trip with some other fellow sort of location independent entrepreneur friends. But yeah, I mean, you definitely can run into people all over the place. Yeah, it's it's surreal because not every Bulgarian village is like that. Not any of them, really. It's just the one because, well, it was a bit of an expat hub before the nomads came in. But Matthias from co-working Bansko really started that community there. And he did a good job. And now it's like, it's taken on its own, its own life. Okay. How about for adventure, adventure travel? Lately, I, I'd probably say Nicaragua because I have so many good memories of adventures there from hiking the volcano to 
hanging out on Little Corn Island, which is this little tiny island in the in the Caribbean where there's no cars and you just feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of favorite countries for that, but that's, that's somewhere that you can, you can get like the beach surfing stuff. You've got the, the hiking and ecotourism, and then you can also explore the rainforest, the island. So pretty, pretty underrated destination. Nice. Okay. How about for quality of life? Like, let's say you're slow matting it and you're going to spend six months somewhere. Mm -hmm. Of course this can change tomorrow or there's many places, but you know, just the one that pops out. This one has been pretty consistent for me. It's kind of a three-way tie. I would say it's between Vancouver, Canada. So I'm picking cities, not countries. I'm kind of that's, cheating there. That's okay. Cheat. Cheat but away. Yeah. Van Vancouver, Canada, it's like if you have the budget to be there and maybe even Vancouver Island. I haven't been to Vancouver Island, but it's just you can have such a nice quality of life there. I like being by water. So I would choose there. I would choose Sydney, Australia, also very expensive. But I like that you have nature, city, and water within a, a small radius. And I just love Amsterdam and the Netherlands. I think, well, Norway too. Norway is one of my favorite countries. Oh, that's another one for adventure, Norway. I've missed that. Okay, we'll add that to the list. But Norway is good for adventure and quality of life because it's so safe and yeah, it's so beautiful. But I do love the Netherlands because I like to ride my bike everywhere. And I like that there's just this intricate network of bike paths and it's also really safe. And it's one of those cultures where it's like live and let live. You can just be yourself and no one's going to judge you. Everything functions. It works. Even if you're not a part of the social system, if you're there as a as an outsider, you can still have a, a nice uh, quality of life there. But then you can't discount Southeast Asia because of the cost of living. Thailand, especially. I mean, I haven't been to Vietnam or Cambodia, but like you can live there for a couple thousand dollars a month and pretty much do whatever you want. Like live in a nice place, go to the spa every day rent a car or a motorcycle, eat out all the time and still keep a low cost of living. Nice. Okay. Two quick ones, two more. I mean, I would be, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about surfing. You mentioned Nicaragua, but can you give us one more spot? Now let's say I'm going to go even a little more niche because I'm a beginner surfer and I would love to have like a nice relaxing beginner's break, but like also that's near sort of a cool town. What do you think? I would say Australia is a good destination for that because they have big waves, but they also have a lot of beginner friendly beach breaks as well as Costa Rica. I think Costa Rica and Mexico are great places to just learn how to surf. There's so many gentle beach breaks, but then there's also, you know, crazy like Puerto Escondido in Mexico with like big barrels and, and things like that. For me, a big surfing paradise is Bali, but there's not many places to learn, like good places to learn. But there's nothing like riding around the Bukit Peninsula on a little moto scooter with your surfboard rack and a backpack and just checking the waves wherever you go and pulling over to surf. Okay. How about food for the last one? Oh, gosh. I'm a pretty big foodie. I have to go to Europe with this. It's, it's pretty cliche, but Italy, France, those are my, those are my top foodie destinations. Okay. I could just live on that food for, for the rest of my life. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, what does music do for you? Music is, it's, it's life. I think it's so integrated with our humanity I was watching a documentary last night about a music producer and, and he, it was actually Jeff Mills, who's one of the fathers, grandfathers of techno. And he, it was actually, it was like um, an excerpt from an interview with him. I can find it so you can add it to the show notes. I'll look in my YouTube history. And he was talking about how 
the the four four drum beat is is very tribal and that you know just the drums you know you've been to a drum circle before like there's something about the beat of the drum and the space between the beats that everyone like no matter which country you're from everybody resonates with that and i don't even know exactly where it comes from you know humans originated from africa um but yeah that's just something that ties everyone together and so i feel like it's it's something that is completely tied in with with life with everything about it whether you're listening to music making music have it on in the background going to see someone play music it's it's just permeates life and that's what I love about it. Okay. Well, not to put you on the spot here, but if you have a track of your own music or a beat or whatever you want us to uh, car- carry us out of this uh, interview, we can play a little snippet if you want to send it over. Oh, yeah. I mean, I haven't released any songs yet. I'm still tinkering around, but I do have I do have one that's mastered, so we can play a little bit of it okay. on the podcast. Cool. What's it called? Wow. It's called... What did I call that one? No reason. Okay. That's what it's called. Well, uh, I have another one that's called Rana. That means frog in Spanish or toad because it sounds, it has some sounds in it that remind me of a frog, <laughs> but that one's not done yet. But yeah, we can share no reason. All right. We're going to getting the exclusive here on the Zero to Travel podcast. All right. Well, we I know we have to turn the tables and we have to do the whole switcheroo here and go on your show, which is going to be a blast. I, I look forward to it. Now I'm a little, I'm getting a little nervous, but I want to say thank you so much for your time. And yeah, I guess just um, let everybody know where, obviously we, we're going to link up to everything. You got your website, travelingwithkristen.com and your, the podcast, Badass Digital Nomads, which uh, is a website too, but you can, people can search for that in their podcast app. Any other places you want people to go to get in touch? Yeah, the main thing would probably just be, yeah, the podcast, my YouTube channel, which is called Traveling with Kristen. We've got some 500 videos over there. So anything you could be interested in. And then for people that want specific help with moving to another country long term or even slow traveling on my website, there's a link for relocation and you can send an inquiry there. What's your best advice for making money on YouTube? Pick a niche. Yeah, I have friends that do one type of video over and over again. And it it seems really boring, but the algorithm understands the videos that they make. It understands the ideal viewer for that video. And so it suggests all of their videos to the perfect audience every time. So it's kind of like if you've ever seen those Noah Kagan videos where he goes around asking people how they make money, like that's the one type of video that really resonates with his audience and and whenever he tries to stray from that format <laughs> the youtube algorithm's like no no <laughs> just stick with not one having thing. it yeah okay <laughs> yeah. that's really interesting yeah and, and for just to, so people know yeah noah does these videos where he goes up to like a stranger basically like he'll knock on a stranger's house or go up to a stranger in their car driving a ferrari or something and we'll just like ask them how they made their money and get a bunch of advice basically. Right. Um, and so that's interesting because like, that's actually from a creator standpoint that makes it much easier. Cause you're just like, uh, I just do this and like, I do this every time and I can just have the same format and kind of automate some of it. But yeah, then you have to be, I mean, I can see how Noah's works because it's like each conversation is unique and that keeps it interesting for him. I'm sure. Um, and of course there's also the rush of like knocking on a stranger's door, like, you know, it's all that, but yeah, let me add to that. Cause you pick one type of video that you want to make, you know, you can change it later, but like, just pick what you think is going to work for you, what you're interested in, and then try to reverse engineer how you're going to monetize that single video. Like don't just depend on AdSense because that's, that should be the smallest part of the revenue that you get from YouTube. Like that directly comes from YouTube. Everybody wants to monetize their channels to get ad revenue, But there's so many other ways that you can monetize. So even if you have zero subscribers, try to optimize each video for monetization from the beginning. Like, does that mean you're going to sell your service, you know, make a video around 
a topic like anxiety and your services are therapy or, you know, make sure it's linked to what you're selling. For some people, it might be affiliate links. Like even if no one clicks on them at the beginning because your video got 10 views, like if you set things up that way from the, from the beginning, then once you do start getting views, then you can start making money. Like you're not going to get brand deals from, you know, having five subscribers, but if you, you know, have a, a business model in mind for your channel, then once it gets big enough to start getting ad revenue and sponsorships and other things like that, it, you won't care as much because you'll already have revenue from other sources. Right. Great advice. Um, to close it out, little favorite quote or a piece of a uh, wisdom or just like some final food for thought, if you want to share before we let you go. Yeah. The thing, the main thing that that I see people struggling with is that they wait too long to really start living the lives that they want. And it can sound a bit cliche, but it's, it's because so many people do it (laughs) that it's almost like just become accepted. You know, we don't have, there's no guarantees for how long any of us have on this planet. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, spend time, Sometimes people come to me saying, you know, they want to move in 10 years from now. And it's like, if there's something that you really want to do, think about how you can do it sooner because there's probably a way that you can shorten that timeline. One of my coaches, Richie Norton, he says, start living the way that you want now, like build your business around the way that you want to live right now or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing a lot of times as humans, we feel like we have to wait. Like it's like we're at point A and we want to get to point B, but then there's all of this uncertainty in between. So I would just leave with everybody is to think about how you can shorten that distance or what is something that you can do today to start living the way you want? Like what is one step you can take towards saving money for your trip or, or planning some travel, you know, booking a place to stay, buying a plane ticket, what is one thing you can do today? Love it. Thank you again. Thanks, Jason and everyone from the Zero to Travel community. It's so nice to meet you guys. We'll talk soon. Cheers. There you have it. Thank you once again to Kristen Wilson for stopping by the show, travelingwithkristen.com. Again, her domain for all of the links and the things if you want to find her work. And we've been in touch here and there since uh, since we chatted. So it's been great to connect with her and hope you enjoyed that conversation. And that call to action at the end, which, uh, by the way, I mentioned at the top of the show, that's going to tie in with something I mentioned about going back to the States, three weeks back in the States with my family. That started with one simple action. It was a phone call to my sister. I said, hey, when are you off? When are you around? Talk to my mom and start planning, you know? Simple phone call, but some of these things you want to do can start so simply, right? With just a conversation and some dates being kicked around. And you get the ball rolling. You get some momentum. So coming out of this, I just want to remind you, if there's something that jumped to the top of your brain when Kristen was sharing that call to action at the end to do a specific thing, take one specific action today, do something, that's one small step. Think about the thing that jumped to your brain, the thing that you might want to do, and like sort of the simplest action you can take and just go for it. Because again, like re-listening to this, I came out of the conversation really fired up. And I imagine hopefully you or some of you out there listening feel the same way, feel inspired. And, you know, let's just take a moment to do that instead of kind of moving on to the next podcast episode or whatever you're doing. Take a moment to think about one small action you can do today. Okay, I want to give a shout out to, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name because I got this as an email, but Shan or Shayan. I'm going to go with Shayan. She said, hi, Jason, Shayan from the Bay Area, California here. I just recently started listening to your podcast over the past month and love them. My wife and I recently welcomed our second daughter and Zero to Travel has been my podcast of choice while rocking the baby to sleep. (laughs) 
I love to know that I'm helping to put babies to sleep out there. Um, goes on to say, I've particularly loved listening to all the stories and feel inspired to continue to shape our own. While both my wife and I work full-time jobs, when our first daughter was four months old, we used our parental leave to embark on an amazing 10-week trip from Hawaii to New Zealand, Australia, and Japan in early 2023 with our baby. We loved every moment of it and hope to continue traveling as much as possible. With our second daughter here, we'll be looking to kick off another 10-week trip. Still finalizing details, but likely we'll make some stops in Madeira and then over to Morocco at least. Eager to see how traveling go- goes with two little ones. Hope to inspire more people to see the world with their own kids. We're also exploring how we can make this a full-time operation in the future and learning lots from the podcast. Love everything you put into Zero to Travel. Hope to keep in touch. And I just want to say thank you for the kind words there, Shan. And also congratulations on your travels and you know, just going for it, even with two little ones, not easy. I remember going to Mexico when my kids were pretty small and ended up somehow in like this, you know, crazy traffic, like 17, 18 hour bus ride. My wife's like breastfeeding in the back and we're sweating. And, you know, I mean, these are the things that happen on the road, but ultimately those experiences, you always remember them and you carry them with you. So uh, good luck on your trip. And just wanted to share this community shout out to inspire anybody else listening, you know, whether it's parental leave or a little gap in your schedule. We talked about that again in this interview, um, like taking a gap year, finding a little space. And even if it's not a year, maybe it's a gap of three days that you can just grab to go do something. See if you can grab it and, and go do the thing you want to do. Okay, I want to say thanks for listening. I got a quote here to close it out. And then I'll leave you with Kristen's track. We talked about her music a little bit, her DJing. And we'll play you out with uh, her song, which I'm blanking on the name. Oh, no reason. That's what it was. No reason. Okay, so we'll leave you with that. And I am going to read this quote that I pulled off of my little Zen calendar the other day from... I lost my glasses, so I can't read the name Wong Tu. This one really hit me, hit me hard, because I was just like, you know, having a tough day yesterday and a lot going on with kids, family stuff, and just like feeling, kind of feeling the 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 pressures of responsibility and settling back into daily life and routines after the trip and everything. And then I got this. So here's the quote. Quote, here it is right now start thinking about it and you miss it end quote (laughs) that one gave me the chills start thinking about it and you miss it no matter what's going on i feel like this quote is a pretty powerful one so anyway read it one more time then i'll let you go with uh with the sounds of uh kristen's music here it is right now start thinking about it and you miss it take care and i'll see you next time peace and love to you and yours cheers by zerototravel.com ideas and advice to make your travel dreams a reality 